Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so let me go ahead and just kind of give you like a prelude to where this starts. Um, essentially, it talks about a guy that goes into a cave and falls asleep and has a dream and his dream is beautiful. It's magnificent. So, <clears throat> so we're gonna go ahead and kick it off. Let's do this. This is going to end up on live stream fails, alligator <laughs> attack live. <coughs> All right guys, this is about to get really deep. So I don't know, some of you guys might not like this. Uh, and some of you, if you guys can just listen and allow your mind to be open to this, it could be really, really good for you. Okay, and then once I start, I'm gonna try to just kind of go straight through it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off now. I don't I don't want to I don't want to be stopping and going too much, but I might be. All right, are we ready? All right, here we go. I am made of light. I am made of stars. He looked at the stars again, and he realized that it's not the stars that create the light, but the light that creates the stars. Everything is made of light, he said and the space in between it's empty. And he knew that everything exists from one living being and that the light is the messenger of the life because it is alive and contains all information. This is what he discovered. Everything in existence is a manifestation of the one living being we call God. Everything is God. And he came to the conclusion that human perception is merely light perceiving light. He also saw that matter is a mirror Everything is a mirror that reflects light and creates images of that light. And the world of the illusion, the dream, is just like smoke, which doesn't allow us to see what we really are. The real us is pure love, pure light, he said. This realization changed his life. Once he knew what he really was, he looked around at other humans and the rest of nature, and he was amazed at what he saw. He saw himself in everything, in every human, in every animal, in every tree, in the water, in the rain, in the clouds, and in the earth. Humans punish themselves endlessly for not being, being what they believe they should be. They become very self-abusive and they use other people to abuse themselves as well. But nobody abuses us more than we abuse ourselves. And it's the judge and the victim and the belief system that make us do this. True, we find who say their husband or wife or mother or father abuse them, but you know that we abuse ourselves much more than that. The way we judge ourselves is the worst judge that ever existed. If we make the mistake and cover it up, as soon as we are alone, the judge becomes so strong, the guilt is so strong, and we feel so stupid or so bad or so unworthy. In your whole life, nobody has ever abused you more than you abuse yourself. And the limit of your self-abuse is exactly the limit that you will tolerate from someone else. If someone abuses you a little more than you abuse yourself, you will probably walk away from that person. But if someone abuses you a little less than you abuse yourself, you will probably stay in that relationship and tolerate it endlessly. If you abuse yourself very badly, then you can even tolerate someone who beats you up, humiliates you, and treats you like dirt. Why? Because in our belief system, I deserve it. This person is doing me a favor by being with me. I'm not worthy of love and respect. I'm not good enough. We have the need to be accepted and to be loved by others, but we cannot accept and love ourselves. The more self-love we have, the less we will experience self-abuse. Self-abuse comes from self-rejection, and self-rejection comes from having an image of what it meant to be perfect and never measuring up to the ideal. Our image of perfection is the reason why we reject ourselves. It is why we don't accept ourselves the way we are and why we don't accept ourselves the way they are. There are thousands of agreements you have made with yourself, with other people, with your dream of life, with God, with society, with your partners, with your parents, with your spouse, with your children. But the most important agreement are the ones you've made with yourself. And these agreements, you tell yourself who you are, what you feel, what you believe, and how to behave. The result is what you call your personality. In these agreements, you say, this is what I am. This is what I believe. Sure. 
and how to behave. The result is what you call your personality. And these agreements you say, that is what I am. That is, I can do certain things and some things I cannot do. This is reality, that is fantasy. This is possible, that is impossible. One single agreement is not such a problem, but we have many agreements that make us suffer, that make us fail in life. If you want to live a life of joy and fulfillment, you have to find the courage to break those agreements that are fear-based and claim your personal power. The agreements that come from fear require us to expend a lot of energy, but the agreements that come from love help us to conserve energy and even gain extra energy. Each of us is born with a certain amount of personal power that we rebuild every day after we rest. Unfortunately, we spend all of our personal power first to create all these agreements and then keep these agreements. Our personal power is dissipated by all the agreements we have uh, created and the result is that we feel powerless. We have just enough power to survive each day because most of it is used to keep the agreements that trap us in the dream of the planet. How can we change the entire dream of our life when we have no power to change even the smallest agreement? If we can see it as our agreements that rule our own life and we don't like the dream that of our life, we need to change the agreements. When we are finally ready to change our agreements, there are four very powerful agreements that we will help to break those agreements that come from fear and deplete our energy. Each time you break an agreement, all the power you use to create it returns to you. If you adopt these four new agreements, they will create enough personal power for you to change the entire system of your old agreements. You need a very strong will in order to adopt the four agreements, but if you begin to live your life with these agreements, the transformation in your life will be amazing. You will see the drama of hell disappear right before your very eyes. Instead of dreaming in a dream of hell, you will be creating a dream of your own personal heaven. I'm gonna go ahead and read what you guys are writing real quick. Something big is swimming, not even kidding. We have to knead these nuts on your chain. <laughs> poems, everybody, poems will really reckon themselves. Is this a self-help book? He's not gonna reply to chat. You can cash him on. How about that? <laughs> I wonder if Jedi had to sit through all this before they got to the good part of this training. I'm strong. <laughs> all right, I guess I am gonna read it after all. Whenever, whenever I have like a break in my note, I'll go ahead and read the chat. Okay. Okay, so we're on the first agreement now. It's be impeccable with your word, okay? Human gossip. Example, you are beginning a new class with a new teacher and you have looked forward to it for a long time. On the first day of class, you run into someone who took the class before who tells you, oh, that instructor was such a pompous jerk. He didn't know what he was talking about and he was a pervert too, so watch out. You are immediately imprinted with the word and the emotional code the person had when saying this. But what you are not aware of is his or her motivation in telling you. The person could be angry for failing the class or simply making an assumption based on fear and prejudice. But because you have learned to ingest information like a child, some part of you believes the gossip and you go into that class. As the teacher speaks, you feel the poison come up inside you and you don't realize you see the teacher through the eyes of the person who gave you the gossip. Then you start talking to the people in the class about this and they start to see the teacher in the same way, as a jerk and a pervert. You really hate the class and soon you decide to drop out. You blame the teacher, but is the gossip to blame? For years we have received the gossip and spells from the words of others, but also from the way we use our own words with our own selves. We talk to ourselves constantly, and most of the times we say things like, Oh, I look fat. I look ugly. I'm getting old. I'm losing my hair. I'm stupid. I never understand anything. I will never be good enough, and I'm never going to be perfect. Do you see how we use these words against ourselves? We must begin to understand what the word is and what the word does. If you understand the first agreement, be impeccable with your word, you begin to see all changes that can happen in your life. Changes first in the way you deal with yourself and later in the way you deal with other people's, especially the ones you love the most. Your opinion is nothing but your point of view. It is not necessarily true. Your opinion comes from your beliefs, your own ego, and your own dream. We create all these poisons and spread it to others just so we can feel right about our own point of view. If we adopt this first agreement and become impeccable with our word, any emotional poison will eventually be clean from our mind 
and from our communication and our own personal relationship, included with our pet, dog, or cat. Impeccability of the word will also give you immunity from anyone putting a negative spell on you. You will only receive a negative idea if your mind is fertile ground for that idea. When you become impeccable with your word, your mind is no longer fertile ground for words that come from black magic. Instead, it is fertile for the words that come from love. You can measure the impeccability of your word by your self-level of self-love. How much you love yourself and how you feel about yourself are directly proportionate to the quality and integrity of your word. You are impeccable with your word. You feel good, you feel happy, and at peace. You can transcend the dream of hell just by making the agreement to be impeccable with your word. Right now, I am planting that seed in your mind. Whether or not the seed grows depends on how fertile your mind is for the seed of love. It is up to you to make the agreement with yourself. I am impeccable with my word. Nurture this seed, and as it grows in your mind, it will generate more seeds of love to replace the seeds of fear. The first agreement will change the kinds of seeds in your mind is fertile, fertile for, being impeccable with your word. This is the first agreement that you should make if you want to be free, if you want to be happy, if you want to transcend the level of existence that is hell. It is very powerful. Use the word in the correct way. Use the word to share your love. Use white magic, beginning with yourself. Tell yourself how wonderful you are, how great you are. Tell yourself how much you love yourself. Use the word to break all those teeny tiny agreements that make you suffer. It is possible. It is possible because I did it and I am no better than you. No, we are exactly the same. We have the same kind of brain, the same kind of bodies. We are humans. If I was able to break those agreements and create new agreements, then you can do the same. If I am impeccable with my word, why not you? Just this one agreement can change your whole life. Impeccability of the word can lead you to personal freedom, to huge success and abundance. It can take away all fear and transform it into joy and love. Just imagine what you create with impeccability of your word. With the impeccability of word, you can transcend the dream of fear and live a different life. You can live in heaven and the thousands of people living in hell because you are immune to that hell. You can attain the kingdom of heaven from this one agreement. Be impeccable with your word. Huh. Uh, all right, so now we are on to the second agreement, my friends. Don't take anything personal. Easier said, kind of obvious, but you still have to understand it. Part of the mind is speaking and part of the mind is listening. It is a big problem when a thousand parts of your mind are all speaking at the same time. This is called a mitote. Mitote is a big important word. It's essentially, like it just said, it's, it's all the parts of your mind talking at the same time. The mitote can be compared to a huge marketplace where thousands of people are talking and bartering at the same time. Each one has different thoughts and feelings. Each one's have a different point of view. The programming in the mind, all of those agreements we have made are not necessarily compatible with each other. Every agreement is like a separate living being. It has its own personality and its own voice. They are conflicting agreements that go against other agreements and on and on until it becomes a big war in the mind. The mitote is the reason humans hardly know what they want, how they want it, or when they want it. They don't agree with themselves because these are part of the minds that's one, that want one thing and part of the mind that wants exactly the opposite. Some parts of the mind has objections to thir certain thoughts and actions, and another part supports the actions of the opposing thoughts. All these little beings create inner conflict because they are alive and they all have it, each have a voice. Only by making an inventory of our agreements will we uncover all the conflicts in the mind and eventually make order out of the chaos of the mitote. Don't take anything personal, because by taking things personal, you set yourself up to suffer for nothing. Humans are addicted to suffering at different levels and to different degrees, and we support each other in maintaining these addictions. Humans agree to 
to help each other suffer. If you have the need to be abused, you will find it easy to be abused by others. Likewise, if you are with people who need to suffer, something in you makes you abuse them. It is as if they have a note on their back that says, please kick me. They are asking for justification for their suffering. Their addictions to suffering is nothing but an agreement that is reinforced every day. Whenever you, wherever you go, you will find people lying to you. And as your awareness grows, you will notice that you lie to yourself. Do not expect people to tell you the truth because they also lie to themselves. You have to trust yourself and choose to believe or not to believe what someone says to you. When we really see other people as they are without taking it personally, we can never be hurt by what they say or do. Even if others lie to you, it is okay. They are lying to you because they are afraid. They are afraid you will discover that they are not perfect. It is painful to take the social mask off. If others say one thing but do another, you are lying to yourself if you don't listen to their actions. But if you are truthful with, you, with yourself, you will save yourself a lot of emotional pain. Telling yourself the truth about it may hurt, but you don't need to be attached to the pain. Healing is on the way, and it's just a matter of time before things will be better for you. If someone is not treating you with love and respect, it is a gift if they walk away from you. If that person doesn't walk away, you will surely endure many years of suffering with him or her. Walking away may hurt for a while, but your heart will eventually heal. Then you can choose what you really want. You will find that you don't need to trust others as much as you need to trust yourself to make the right choices. When you make it a strong habit to not take anything personal, you avoid many upsets in your life. Your anger, jealousy, and envy will disappear, and even your sadness will simply disappear if you don't take anything personally. If you can make this second agreement a habit, you will find that nothing can put you, in, can put you back into hell. There is a huge amount of free, freedom that comes to you when you take nothing personally. You become immune to black magicians and no spell can affect you regardless of how strong it may be. The whole world can gossip about you and if, if you don't take it personally, you are immune. Someone can intentionally send you emotional poison and if you don't take it personally, you will not eat it. When you don't take the emotional poison, it becomes even worse in the sender, but not in you. You can see how important this agreement is. Taking nothing personally helps you to break many habits and routines that trap you in the dream of hell and cause needless suffering. Just by practicing this second agreement, you begin to break dozens of teeny tiny agreements that cause you to suffer. And if you practice the first two agreements, you will break 75% of the teeny tiny agreements that trap you in hell. Write this agreement on a piece of paper and put it on your refrigerator to remind you all the time. Don't take anything personally. As you make it a habit of not taking anything personally, you won't need to place your trust in what others do or say. You will only need to trust yourself to make responsible choices. You are never responsible for the actions of others. You are only responsible for you. When you truly understand this and refuse to take things personally, you can hardly be hurt by the careless comments or actions of others. If you, if you keep this agreement, you could travel around the world with your heart completely open and no one can hurt you. You can say, I love you, without fear of being ridiculed or rejected. You can ask for what you need. You can say yes, or you could say no, whatever you choose, without guilt or self-judgment. You can choose to follow your heart always. Then you could be in the middle of hell and still experience inner peace and happiness. You can stay in your state of bliss and hell will not affect you at all. I'm gonna go to a different backdrop, but I'm not finished. So I'm gonna go find a different backdrop just to change it up for the video. <coughs> Hopefully I don't slide down this hill. I don't know, it's a little, a little freaky over there. We're gonna go ahead and go through this. This is not, this is a road less traveled, we'll say that much. Oh look, there's a dandelion with a bug. Yeah. Oh, I moved the bug around. Oh well. All right. 
I think there's a good spot over here. I've been here one time. I've been here one time. Okay, maybe I lie. I've been here two times. Now it's three times. Alright, this is a good looking spot. Oh, there's a bird. <coughs> uh, where am I going to sit? I guess I could sit on this tree. like a legitimate tripod. Oh, nature is lit right now. I don't know, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a better spot, I'm gonna get a better spot. I guess I could just like go this way. That's nice. Alright. Alright, that's good. Alright, so the first agreement, be impeccable with your word. Second agreement, don't take anything personal. Third agreement, do not make assumptions, okay? The third agreement is don't make assumptions. We have the tendency to make assumptions about everything. The problem is, the problem with making assumptions is that we believe that they are true. We could swear they are real. We make assumptions about what others are doing or thinking. We take it personally. Then we blame them and react by sending emotional poison with our word. That is why whenever we make assumptions, we're asking for problems. We make an assumption we misunderstand. We take it personally and we end up creating a whole big drama for nothing. All that sadness and drama you have lived in your life was rooted in making assumptions and taking things personally. Take a moment to the, consider the truth of this statement. The whole war of co control between humans is about making con uh, assumptions and taking things personally. Our whole dream of hell is based on that. We create a lot of emotion poison. <coughs> we create a lot of emotional poison just by making assumptions and taking it personally because usually we start gossiping about our assumptions. Remember, gossiping is the way we com communicate to each other in the dream of hell and transfer poison to one another because we are afraid to ask for clarification. This is important right here. We make assumptions and believe we are right about the assumptions. Then we defend our assumptions and try to make someone else wrong. It is always better to ask questions than to make assumptions. Because assumptions set us up for suffering. The big mitote in the human mind creates a lot of chaos which causes us to misinterpret everything and misunderstand everything. We only see what we want to see and hear, what we want to hear. We don't perceive things the way they are. We have the habit of dreaming with no basis in reality. We literally dream up things in our imaginations because we don't understand something. We make an assumption about the meaning, and when the truth comes out, the bubble, the bubble of our dream pops, and we find out that it was not what it was all along. The way to keep yourself from making assumptions is to ask questions. Make sure the communication is clear. If you don't understand, ask. Have the courage to ask questions until you are clear as you can be. And even then, do not assume you know all there is to know about the given situation. Once you hear the answer, you will not have to make assumptions because you will know the truth. Also, find your voice to ask for what you want. It's another big one. Ask for what you want. Everyone has the right to tell you no or yes, but you always have the right to ask. Likewise, everybody has the right to ask you and you have the right to say yes or no. If you don't understand something, it is better for you to ask and be clear instead of making an assumption. The day you stop making assumptions, you will communicate cleanly and clearly, free of emotional poison. Without making assumption, your word becomes impeccable. With clear communication, all of your relationships will change, not only with your partner, but with everyone else. 
You won't need to make assumptions because, every, because everything becomes so clear. That is what I want. This is what you want. If we communicate in this way, our word becomes impeccable. If all humans com could communicate in this way, with impeccability of the word, there would be no wars, no violence, no misunderstandings. All human problems would be resolved if we could just have good, clear communication. This, then, and the third agreement, don't make assumptions. Just saying this sounds easy, but I, don't, but I understand that it is difficult to do. It is difficult because we are so often do exactly the opposite. We have all these habits and routines that we are not aware of. Becoming aware of these habits and understanding the importance of this agreement is the first step. But understanding its importance is not enough. Information or an idea is merely the seed in your mind. What, what will really make the difference is the action. Taking this action over and over again strengthens your will, nurtures the seed, and establishes a solid foundation for this new habit to grow. After many repetitions, this new agreement will become second nature, and you will see how the magic of your word transforms you from a black magician into a white magician. A white magician uses the word for creation, giving, sharing, and loving. By making this one agreement a habit, your whole life will be completely transformed. When you transform your whole dream, magic just happens in your life. What you need comes to you easily because spirit moves freely through you. This is the mastery of intent, the mastery of the spirit, the mastery of love, the mastery of gratitude, and the mastery of life. This is the goal of the Toltec. This is the path to personal freedom. <clears throat> All right, so we did the first three, we're down to four. Be impeccable with your word, don't make assumptions, don't take anything personal. And my favorite, all-time favorite, number four, doing your best. This is my favorite agreement of the four agreements. When you do your best, you learn to accept yourself. But you have to be aware and learn from your mistakes. Learning from your mistakes means you practice, look honestly at the result, and keep practicing. This increases your awareness. Doing your best really doesn't feel like work because you enjoy whatever you are doing. You know you're doing your best when you are enjoying the action or doing it in a way that will not have negative repercussions on you. You do your best because you want to do it, not because you have to do it. Not because you are trying to please the judge and not because you are trying to please other people. If you take actions because you have to, then there is no way you are going to do your best. Then it is better not to do it. No. You do your best because doing your best all the time makes you so happy. When you are doing your best just for the pleasure of doing it, you are taking action because you enjoy the action. Action is about living fully. Inaction is the way that we deny life. Inaction is sitting in front of the television every day for years because you are afraid to be alive and to take the risk of expressing what you are. Expressing what you are is taking action. You can have many great ideas in your head, but what makes the difference is the action. Without action upon an idea, there will be no manifestation, no result, and no reward. A good example of this comes from the story of Forrest Gump. He didn't have a great idea, but he took action. He was happy because he always did his best at whatever it was. He was richly rewarded without expecting any reward at all. Taking action is being alive. It's taking the risk to go out and express your dream. God is life. God is life in action. The best way to say, I love you, God, is to live your life doing your best. The best way to say thank you, God, is by letting go of the past and living in the present moment, right here, right now. Whatever life takes away from you, let it go. When you surrender and let go of the past, you allow yourself to be fully alive in the moment. Letting go of the past means you can enjoy the dream that is happening right now. 
If you live in the past dream, you don't enjoy what is happening right now because you will always wish it to be different than it is. There is no time to miss anyone or anything because you are alive. Not enjoying what is happening right now is living in the past and being only half alive. This leads to self-pity, suffering, and tears. You were born with the right to be happy. You were born with the right to love, to enjoy and share your love. You are alive. So take your life and enjoy it. Don't resist life passing through you because that is God passing through you. Just your existence proves the existence of God. Your existence proves the existence of life and of energy. We don't need to know or prove anything. Just to be, to take a risk and enjoy your life is all that matters. Say no when you want to say no and yes when you want to say yes. You have the right to be you. You can only be you when you do your best. When you don't do your best, you are denying yourself the right to be you. That's a seed that you should really nurture in your mind. You don't need knowledge or great psychological concepts. You don't need the acceptance of others. You express your own divinity by being alive and by loving yourself and others. It is an expression of God to say, hey, I love you. The first three agreements will only work if you do your best. Don't expect that you will always be able to be impeccable with your word. Your routine habits are too strong and firmly rooted in your mind, but you can always do your best. Don't expect that you will never take anything personal. Just do your best. Don't expect that you will never make another assumption, but you can certainly do your best. By doing your best, the habits of misusing your word, taking things personal, and making assumptions will become weaker and less frequent with time. You don't need to judge yourself, feel guilty, or punish yourself if you cannot keep these agreements. If you're doing your best, you will feel good about yourself even if you're still making assumptions, still taking things personally, and still are not impeccable with your word. If you do your best always, over and over again, you will become a master of transformation. Practice. Practice makes the master. By doing your best, you become a master. Everything you have ever learned, you learn through repetition. You learn to write, to drive, and even to walk by repetition. You are a master of speaking your language because you practice. Action, action is what makes the difference. If you do your best in the search for personal freedom, in the search for self-love, you will discover that it is just a matter of time before you find what you are looking for. It's not about daydreaming or sitting for hours dreaming in meditation. You have to stand up and be a human. You have the honor, you have to honor the man or woman that you are. Respect your body, enjoy your body, love your body, feed, clean, and heal your body. Exercise and do what makes your body feel good. When you honor these four agreements together, there is no way that you will live in hell. There is no way. If you are impeccable with your word, if you don't take anything personal, if you don't make assumptions, if you always do your best, then you are going to have a beautiful life. You are going to control your life 100%. The four agreements are a summary of the mastery of transformation. One of the mastery is of the Toltec. You transform hell into heaven. The dream of the planet is transformed into personal dream of heaven. So that was the four agreements. There's some really good stuff I'm going to finish up with. A nice little closing. Um, one of them I actually was going to use as an, as an introduction. But I'm going to go ahead and finish, keep the best for last, right? So everything from here on out is really, really good. Are we really free? Are we free to be who we really are? The answer is no. We are not free. True, freedom has to do with the human spirit. It is the freedom to be who we really are. We have memories of long ago when we used to be free and we loved being free, but we have forgotten what freedom really means to us. 
If we see a child who is two or three, perhaps four years old, we find a free human. Why is this human free? Because this human does whatever he, he or she wants to do. The human is completely wild, just like a flower, a tree, or an animal that has not been domesticated. Wild. And if we observe humans who are two years old, we find that most of the time, these humans have a big smile on their face and they're having fun. They are exploring the world. They are not afraid to play. They are afraid when they are hurt, when they are hungry, when some of their needs are not met, but they don't worry about the past. They don't care about the future and only live in the present moment. Very young children are not afraid to express what they feel. They are so loving that if the per they perceive love, they melt into the love. They are not afraid to love at all. That is the description of a normal hu human being. As children, we are not afraid of the future or ashamed of the past. Our normal human tendencies is to enjoy life, to play, to explore, to be happy, and to love. But what has happened with the adult human? Why are we so different? Why are we not wild? From the point of view of the victim, we can say that something sad happened to us. And from the point of the view of the warrior, we can say that, that what happened to us is normal. What has happened to is that we have the book of law, the big judge and the victim that rule our lives. We are no longer free because the judge and the victim and the belief system don't allow us to be who we really are. Once our minds have been programmed with all that garbage, we are no longer happy. This chain of training from human to human, from generation to generation, is perfectly normal in human society. You don't need to blame your parents for teaching you to be like them. What else could they teach you but what they know? They did the best they could, and if they abused you, it was due to their own domestication, their own fears, their own beliefs. They have no control over the programming they received, so they couldn't have be behaved any differently. There is no need to blame your parents or anyone who's, who abused you in your life, including yourself. But it is time to stop the abuse. It is time to free yourself of the tyranny of the judge by changing the foundation of your own agreements. It is time to be free from the role of the victim. Play class today? <laughs> the real you is still a little child who never grew up. Sometimes that little child comes out of you when you are having fun or playing, when you feel happy, when you are painting, writing poetry, playing the piano, or expressing yourself in some way. These are the happiest moments of your life, when the real you comes out, when you don't care about the past and you don't worry about the future. You are childlike. But there is something that changes all that. We call them responsibilities. The judge says, wait a second, you are responsible. You have things to do. You have work, you have to go to school, you have to earn a living. We are still children, but we have lost our freedom. The freedom we are looking for is the freedom to be ourselves, to express ourselves. But if we look at our lives, we will see that most of the time we do things just to please others, just to be accepted by others, rather than living our lives to please ourselves. This is what ha has happened to our freedom, and we see in our society and all the societies around the world that for every thousand people, 999 are completely domesticated. The worst part is that most of us are not even aware that we are not free. There is something inside that whispers to us that we are not free, but we do not understand what it is and why we are not free. The problem with most people is that they live their lives and never discover that the judge and the victim rule their mind. And therefore, they don't have a chance to be free. The first step toward personal freeness is awareness. We need to be aware that we are not free in order to be free. We need to be aware of what the problem is in order to solve the problem. Awareness is always the first step because if you are not aware, there is no nothing you can change. If you are not aware that your mind is full of wounds and emotional poison, you cannot begin to clean and heal the wounds and you will continue to suffer. There is no reason to suffer. With awareness, you can rebel and say, this is enough. You can look for a way to heal and transform your personal dream. The dream of the planet is just a dream. It is not even real. If you go into the dream and start challenging your beliefs, 
you will find that most of the beliefs that guided you into the wounded mind are not even true. You will find that suffered, you've suffered all those years of drama for nothing. Why? Because a belief system that we, was put into your mind is based on lies. That is why it is important for you to master your own dream. That is why the Toltecs became dream masters. Your life is a manifestation of your dream. It is an art. And you, you can change your life anytime if you aren't enjoying your dream. Had an auto in insurance related problem? What the heck? I don't know what you're talking about, man. Can you help me out a bit? Auto insurance? Really? <laughs> Funny. I'm almost done. After this, I'll help you with your auto insurance. <sighs> when we talk about the Toltec path to freedom, we find that they have an entire map for breaking free of domestication. They compare the judge, the victim, and the belief system to a parasite that invades the human mind. From the Toltec point of view, all humans who are domesticated are sick. They are sick because there is a parasite that controls the mind and controls the brain. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I love this, this hoodie. <clears throat> they are sick because they are a parasite that controls the mind and the brain. The food that, for the parasite is the negative emotion that comes from fear. If we look at the description of a parasite, we find that a parasite is a living being who lives off of other living beings, sucking their energy without any useful contribution in return and hurting their host little by little. The judge and the victim and the belief system fit this description very well. Together they comp compromise a living being made of psychic or emotional energy, and the energy is life. Of course it is not material energy, but neither are emotion, neither, neither emotional energy. Our dreams are not material energy, but we know they exist. One function of the brain is to transform material energy into emotional energy. Our brain is the factory of emotions, and we have said that the main function of the mind is to dream. The Toltecs believe that the parasite, the judge, the victim, and the belief system has control of your mind. It contro controls your personal dream. The parasite dreams through your mind and lives its life through your body. It survives on the emotions that come from fear and thrives on drama and suffering. The freedom we seek is to use our own mind and body to live our own life. Instead of the life of the belief system, when we discover that the mind is controlled by the judge and the victim, and that the real us is in the corner, we have just two choices. <laughs> uh, temperature here? Actually, Wednesday is going to be like our first hot day of the year. Um, today it is... I'm going to say like 60s. Uh, the, fr the freedom we seek in our own mind and body to live our own life instead of the life of the belief system, when we discover that the mind is controlled by the judge and the victim, and oh shit, I already read that. One choice is to keep living the way we are, to surrender to the judge and the victim, to keep living in the dream of the planet. The second choice is to do what we do as a child. When, pra when parents try to domesticate us, we can rebel and say no. We can declare war against the parasite. A war against the judge and the victim. A war for our independence. A war for the right to use our own mind and our own brain. This is why in all the, sh the sh shamanic, shamanic traditions in America, from Canada to Argentina, people call themselves warriors. Because they are in a war against a parasite in the mind. That is the real meaning of the warrior. The warrior is one who rebels against the invasion of the parasite. The warrior rebels and declares a war, but to be a warrior doesn't mean we always win the war. But to be a warrior doesn't mean we may win or we may lose, but we always do our best and at least we have a chance to be free again. Choosing this path gives us at the very least the dignity of rebellion and ensures that we will not be helpless victims of our own whimsical emotions or the poisonous emotions of others. Even if we succumb to the enemy, the parasite, we will not be among those victims who would not fight back. At best, being a warrior gives us an opportunity to transcend the dream of the planet and to change our personal dream to a dream that we call heaven. Hey, I'm glad you like it, man. 
Can you ask the question? Yeah, man, go ahead and ask a question. Uh, I actually got this hoodie at Walmart. Um, and uh, I got this hoodie at Walmart, and I don't know if it's going to be... I think it's a collector's item now. I don't... I found it at Walmart in Seattle, Washington. So, like, er, a friend of mine lent his car to his son, right? And uh, he got hit by a drunk driver. Now both parties are claiming they are not... At fault, uh, the other party should have been on the road. What should I do? If the guy was a drunk driver. I feel like if he got, you know, if he got a ticket for being a drunk driver, obviously they're gonna pin it all on him. All right, guys, I'm almost finished up here. This is this is uh, this next part I'm reading is really good. <laughs> Walmart is known for its collector's items. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Just like hell, heaven is a place that exists within our own mind. It is a place of joy, a place where we are happy, where we are free to love and to be who we really are. We can reach heaven while we are alive. We don't have to wait until we die. God is always present and the kingdom of heaven is everywhere. But first, we need to have the eyes and the ears to see and hear the truth. We have learned that the dream you are living now is the result of the outside dream hooking your attention and feeding you all of your beliefs. The process of domestication can be called the dream of the first attention because it is how your attention was used for the first time to create the first dream of your life. One way to change your beliefs is to focus your attention on all those agreements and beliefs and change the agreements with yourself. In doing this, you are using your attention for the second time, thus creating the dream of the second attention to the new dream. The difference is that you are no longer innocent. When you were a child, this was not true. You didn't have a choice, but you are no longer a child. Now it's up to you to choose what to believe and what not to believe. You can cho choose to believe any of these things, and that includes being in yourself. <sighs> the first step is to become aware of the fog that is in your mind. You must become aware that you are dreaming all the time. Only with awareness do you have the possibility of transforming your dream. If you have the awareness that the whole drama of your life is a result of what you believe, and what you believe is not real, then you could change. Then you could begin to change it. What is the title of the book, The Four Agreements? Um, I actually, uh, I actually narrowed down like the best parts of the book. So I, I managed to read through the whole thing. If you guys, uh, if you guys are just now joining the stream, um, you should really check out the past broadcast. Um, it's really good. However, to really change your beliefs, you need to focus your attention on what it is that you want to change. You have to know which agreements you want to change before you can change them. So the next step is to develop awareness of all the self-limiting, fear-based beliefs that make you unhappy. You take an inventory of all that you believe, all your agreements, and through this process you could begin the transformation. The Toltecs called this the art of transformation, and it is a whole mastery. You achieve the mastery of transformation by changing the fear-based agreements that make you suffer and reprogramming your mind in your own way. I love dragons too. It's not biblical. Um, actually, this guy I really appreciate. He's, he, I, we're about to get to a part where he kind of, he mentions Jesus and, and stuff, but you know, he himself is, he's a Toltec, so that's, uh, it's it's not even almost a religion. I think it's just kind of like a, a uh, the Toltecs are like you know, old Mexican Mayan people or something like that. Um, you know, the, the Mayans are cool, man. I want to go to Mexico and check that out. Kind of kind of figure out what's going on with those people. Um, but he talks about Buddhism and everything, and he just he appreciates everything, man. That's what this book's about is appreciating everything. I mean, there's nothing not to appreci appreciate. You know, you sit, sit by these four agreements, and then you can. You can appreciate everything around you. Um, but we're finishing up here. We're almost done. Um, these last pages are really, really good. 
But for every agreement you break that makes you suffer, you will need to replace it with a new agreement that makes you happy. This will keep the old agreement from coming back. If you oc occupy the same space with a new agreement, then the old agreement is gone forever and it is in the place of a new agreement. There are many strong beliefs in the mind that can make this process look hopeless. This is why you need to go step by step. Be patient with yourself because this is a slow process. The way you are living now is the result of many years of domestication. You cannot expect to break the domestication in one day. You'll pay my Big words. I, there's actually not that many big words in this book. We are addicted to being the way we are. We are addicted to anger, jealousy, and self-pity. We are addicted to the beliefs that tell us, I'm not good enough. I'm not intelligent enough. Ah, my leg's falling asleep. Every human has an emotional body completely covered with infected wounds. Each wound is an infected with emotional poison. The poison of all the emotions that make us suffer, such as hate, anger, envy, and sadness. An action, an action of injustice opens a wound in the mind and reacts with emotional poison because of the concepts and beliefs that we have about injustice and what is fair. The mind is so wounded and full of poison by the process of domestication that everyone describes the wounded mind as normal. This is considered normal, but I can tell you it is not normal. We have a dysfunctional dream of the planet, and humans are mentally sick with a disease called fear. The symptoms of this disease are the emotions that make us humans suffer. Anger, hate, sadness, envy, and betrayal. When the fear is too great, the reasoning mind becomes, begins to fail, and we call this mental illness. Psychotic behavior occurs when the mind is so frightened and the wound so painful that it seems better to break contact with the outside world. If we, could see our mind, if we could see our state of mind as a disease, we find that there is a cure. We don't have to suffer any longer. First, we need the truth to open the emotional wounds, take the poison out, and heal the wounds completely. How do we do this? We must forgive those, who, who, we, must forgive those we feel who have wronged us. Not because they deserve to be forgiven, but because we love ourselves so much that we don't need to keep paying for this injustice. Forgiveness is the only way to heal. We can choose to forgive because we feel compassion for ourselves. We can let go of the resentment and declare, that's enough. I will no longer be the judge that goes against myself. I will no longer beat myself up and abuse myself. I will no longer be the victim. First, we need to forgive our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, and God. Once you forgive God, then you can finally forgive yourself. Once you forgive yourself, the self-rejection in your mind is over. Self-acceptance begins and the self-love will go, grow so strong that you will finally accept yourself just the way you are. That's the beginning of the, of the free human. Forgiveness is key. Y'all are crazy. All right, you guys ready? We're getting close to the end. The final way to attain personal freedom is to prepare ourselves for the initiation of the dead. This is, this is hard for people to concept, but essentially, if you think about the, what are they called? The something of death? The, I don't know, not, not the guy with the stick, the other people. Um, show the other side of the tree. Uh, the name of the book is The Four Agreements. You have no... <laughs> That's close to the end. Uh, Alright, here we go. With the angel of death. There it is. Look at that. The next thing I said. Okay, so this is about the angel of death. And if you can come to grips with the angel of death. Wait, wait till you hear this part. This part's really good. I like this. What the angel of death can teach us is how, we, how to be truly alive. We become aware that we can die at any moment. We have just the present to live. The truth is that we don't know if we are going to die tomorrow. Who knows? We have the idea that we have many years in the future, but do we? If we go to the hospital and the doctor tells us that we have one week to live, what are we going to do? As we, as we have said before, we have two choices. 
One is to suffer because we are going to die and we'll tell everyone, poor me, I am going to die and really create a huge drama. The other choice is to use every moment to be happy, to do what we really enjoy doing. If we only have one week to live, let's enjoy life. Let's be alive. We can say, I'm going to be myself. No longer am I going to run my life trying to please other people. No longer am I going to be afraid of what they think about me. What do I care what other people think of me? I'm going to die in one week. I'm going to be myself. The angel of death can teach us to live every day as if it is the last day of our lives. As if there, there may be no tomorrow. We can begin each day by saying, I am awake. I see the sun. I'm going to give my gratitude to the sun and to everything and everyone around me because I am alive. One more day to be myself. That is what, the way I see life. That is what the angel of death taught me. To be completely open to know that there is nothing to be afraid of. And of course I treat the people I love with love because this may be the last day that I can tell you how much I love you. I don't know if I'm going to see you again. So I don't want to fight with you. What if I had a big fight with you and I told you all this emotional poison that I have against you and you die tomorrow? Oops, oh my God, the judge will, will get me so bad and I will feel so guilty for everything that I told you. I will even feel guilty for not telling you how much I love you. The love that makes you happy is the love that I can share with you. Why do I need to deny that I love you? It is not important if you love me back. I may die tomorrow or you may die tomorrow. What makes me happy now is to let you know how much I love you. You can live your life this way. By doing so, you prepare yourself for the initiation of death. What is going to happen in the initiation of death is that the old dream that you have in your mind is going to die forever. Yes, you are going to have the memories of the parasite, of the judge, the victim, and what you used to believe, but the parasite will be dead. That is what is going to die in the initiation of death, the parasite. It is not easy to go, for the, to go for the initiation of death because the judge and the victim will fight with everything they have. They don't want you to die. And we feel we are the ones who are going to die and we are afraid of this death. When we live in the dream of the planet, it is as if we are dead. Whoever survives the initiation of the dead receives the most wonderful gift, the resurrection. To receive the resurrection is to arise from the dead, to be alive, to be ourselves again. The resurrection is to be like a child, to be wild and free, but with a difference. The difference is that we have freedom. With wisdom instead of innocence, we are able to break our domestication, become free again, and heal our mind. We surrender to the angel of death, knowing that the parasite will die, and we will still be alive with a healthy mind and perfect reason. Then we are free to use our own mind and run our own life. This is what in the Toltec way the angel of death teaches us. Teaches us. The angel of death comes to us and says, you see everything that exists here in your mind? It is not yours. Your house, your spouse, your children, your car, your career, your money. Everything in the mind, I can take it away when I want to. But for now, you can use it. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Swagmaster, holy shit, dude, how are you? If we surrender to the angel of death, we will be happy forever and ever. Why? Because the angel of death takes the past away in order to make it possible for life to continue. For, <coughs> for every moment that is the past, the angel of death keeps taking that part that is dead and we keep living in the present. The parasite wants us to carry the past with us and that makes it so heavy to be alive. When we try to live in the past, how can we enjoy the present? When we dream of the future, why must we carry the burden of the past? When are we going to live in the present? That is what the angel of death teaches us. <coughs> All right, guys, it keeps getting better till the end. So the best parts are about to be in, about to be read. We're very close to the end. I want you to forget the four agreements. I want you to forget everything you have learned in your life. This is the beginning of the new understanding, a new dream. The dream you are living is your creation. It is your perception of reality that you can change it at any time. 
You have the power to create hell and you have the power to create heaven. Why not dream a different dream? Why not use your mind, use your imagination and your emotions to dream heaven? Just use your imagination and a tremendous thing will happen. Imagine that you have the ability to see the world with different eyes whenever you choose. Each time you open your eyes, you can see the whole world around you in a different way. Close your eyes now and then open them and look outside. What you will see is love coming out of the trees, love coming out of the sky, love coming out of the light. You will perceive love from everything around you. This is the state of bliss. You perceive love directly from everything, including yourself and other humans. Even when humans are sad or angry, behind these feelings you can see that they are also sending love. Using your imagination and your new eyes of perception, I want to see yourself living a new life. A new dream, a life where you don't need to justify your existence and you are free to be who you really want to be. Imagine that you have permission to be happy and to really enjoy your life. Your life is free of conflict with yourself and with others. Are you ready for the best part of this whole book? Here it comes. Imagine living your life without fear of expressing your dreams. You know what you want, what you don't want, and when you want it. You are free to change your life the way you really want to. You are not afraid to ask for what you need, to say yes or to no to anything or to anyone. Imagine living your life without the fear of being judged by others. You no longer rule your behavior according to what others may think about you. You are no longer responsible for anyone's opinions. You have no need to control anyone and no one controls you either. Imagine living your life without judging others. You can easily forgive others and let go of any judgments they, that you have. You don't have the need to be right and you don't need to make anyone else wrong. You respect yourself and everyone else and they respect you in return. Imagine living without the fear of loving and not being loved. You are no longer afraid to be rejected and you don't have the need to be accepted. You can say, I love you with no shame or justification. You can walk in the world with your heart completely open and not afraid to be hurt. Imagine living your life without being afraid to take a risk and to explore life. You are not afraid to lose anything. You are not afraid to be alive in the world and you are not afraid to die. Imagine that you love yourself just the way you are. You love your body just the way it is and you love your emotions just the way they are. You know that you are perfect just as you are. The reason I ask you to imagine these things is because they are all entirely possible. You can live in the state of grace and the state of bliss, the dream of heaven. But in order to experience this dream, you must first understand what it is. Only love has the ability to put you in the state of bliss. Being in bliss is like being in love. Being in love is like being in bliss. You are floating in the clouds. You are perceiving love wherever you go. It is entirely possible to live this way all the time. It is possible because others have done it and they are no different from you and me. They live in bliss because they have ch changed their agreements and are dreaming a different dream. <laughs> Go tell your friend Brian that you love him, bro. <laughs> Once you feel what it means to live in a state of bliss, you will love it. You will know that heaven on earth is truth. The heaven truly exists. Once you know that heaven exists, once you know it is possible to stay there, it's up to you to make the effort to do it. 2,000 years ago, Jesus told us about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of love, but hardly anyone was ready to hear this. They said, what are you talking about? 
My heart is empty. I don't feel the love that you are talking about. I don't feel the peace you have. You don't have to do this. Just imagine that his message of love is possible and you will find that it is yours. The world is very beautiful and very wonderful. Life can be very easy when you love, when love is the way of life. You can be loving all the time. This is your choice. You may not have a reason to love, but you can love because, because love makes you happy. Love, is, love in action only produces happiness. Love will give you inner peace. It'll change your perception on everything. You can see everything with the eyes of love. You can be aware that there is love all around you. When you live this way, there is no longer a fog in your mind. The mitote has gone on a permanent vacation. This is what humans have been seeking for centuries. For thousands of years, we have been searching for happiness. Happiness is the lost paradise. Humans have worked so hard to reach this point, and this is the part of evolution in our mind. This is the future of humanity. This way of life is possible, and it's in your hands. Moses called it the promised land, Buddha called it nirvana, Jesus called it heaven, and the Toltecs called it a new dream. Unfortunately, your identity is mixed with the dream of the planet. All of your beliefs and agreements are there in the fog. You feel the presence of the parasite and believe it is you. This makes it difficult to let go, to release the parasite, and create the space to experience love. You are attached to the, to the judge, attached to the victim. Suffering makes you feel safe because you know it so well. But there is really no reason to suffer. The only reason you suffer is because you choose to suffer. If you look at your life, you will find many excuses to suffer. But a good reason to suffer you will, will not find. That's really good. I didn't highlight that part. I'm going to read that again. If you look at your life, you will find many excuses to suffer. But a good reason to suffer you will not find, said Yoda. The same is true for happiness. The only reason you are happy is because you choose to be happy. Happiness is a choice, and so is suffering. Maybe we cannot escape from the destiny of human, but we have a choice, to suffer our destiny or to enjoy our destiny. To suffer or to love and be happy, to live in hell or to live in heaven. My choice is to live in heaven. What is yours? Will God forgive you if you're a homosexual? We are all one people and everybody is love. Race, creed, sexuality, gender, does not matter. We are all one people, we are all one light. And it's, we're all together. All right, let's finish it off. Guys, I know some of you might not be super religious, but the book does close with a prayer. And I'm gonna go ahead and read the prayer. And if anybody has been watching the stream for a while and has been really encouraged by it, feel free to bow your head and pray with me. And we'll go ahead and I think it's going to let us know when the prayer actually begins. It might be right away. Okay, yeah, it's right away. So if y'all would like to pray, feel free. I'm going to be reading or I would be praying myself. Please take a moment to close your eyes. Open your heart and feel all the love that comes from your heart. I want you to join with my words in your mind and in your heart to feel a very strong connection of love. Together we are going to do a very special prayer to experience a communion with our Creator. Focus your attention on your lungs as if your lungs exist. Feel the pleasure when your lungs expand to fulfill the biggest need of the human body, to breathe. Take a deep breath and feel the air as it fills your lungs. Feel how the air is nothing but love. Notice that the connection between the air and the lungs is a connection of love. Expand your lungs with air until your body has the need to expel that air. And then exhale and feel the pleasure again. Because when we fulfill any need of the human body, it gives us pleasure. To breathe gives us pleasure. Just to breathe is enough, is enough for us to always be happy and to enjoy life. Just being alive is enough. Feel the pleasure to be alive, the pleasure of feeling of love. The Prayer for Freedom Today, Creator of the Universe, we ask that you come to us and share with us a strong communion of love. We know that your real name is love, that you, 
that to have a communion with you means to share the same vibrations, the same frequencies that you are. Because you are the only thing that exists in the universe. Today, help us to be like you are. To love life. To be, li to be alive and to love. Help us to love the, the way that you love. With no conditions, no expectations, no obligations, without any judgment. Help us to love and accept ourselves without any judgment. Because when we judge ourselves, we find ourselves guilty and we need to be punished. Help us to love everything you create unconditionally, especially other human beings, especially those who live around us, all our relatives and people whom we try to love so hard. Because when we reject them, we reject ourselves. And we, when we reject ourselves, we reject you. Help us to love others just the way just the way they are without no conditions. Help us to accept them the way they are without judgment because if we judge them, we find them guilty, we blame them, and we have the need to punishment. Today, clean our hearts of an emotional poisons that we are. Free our minds from any judgment so that we can live in complete peace and complete love. Today is a very special day. Today, we open our hearts to love again so that we can tell each other I love you without any fear and really mean it. Today, we offer ourselves to you. Come to us. Use our voice, use our eyes, use our hands, and use our hearts to share ourselves in communion of love with everyone. Today, Creator, help us to be just like you are. Thank you for everything that we receive this day, especially for the freedom to be who we really are. Amen. There's still one more prayer. We are going to share a beautiful dream together, a dream that you will, will love to have all of the time. In this dream, you are in the middle of a beautiful, warm, sunny day beautiful warm sunny day. You hear the birds, the wind, this is talking about my situation right now, and a little river. What the heck? Are you kidding me? I got my little river over here. You hear the birds, the wind, a little river. You walk towards the river. At the edge of the river is an old man in meditation, and you see that out of his head comes a beautiful light of different colors. You try not to bother him, but he notices your presence and opens his eyes. He has the kind of eyes that, that are full of love and a big smile. You ask him, how is he able to radiate all that beautiful light? You ask him if he can teach you to do what he is doing. He replies that many, many years ago, he asked the same questions of his teacher. The old man begins to tell you his story. My teacher opened his chest and took out his heart, and he took out a beautiful flame from his heart. Then he opened my chest, opened my heart, and he put that little flame inside it. He put my heart back in my chest, and as soon as my heart was inside me, I felt intense love, because the flame he put in my heart was his own love. That flame grew in my heart and became a big, big fire. A fire that doesn't burn, but purifies everything that it touches and that fire touched each one of his cells of my body. And the cells of my body loved me back. I became one with my body, but my love grew even more. That fire touched every emotion of the mind, and all the emotion transformed into a strong, intense love. And I loved myself completely and unconditionally. But the fire kept burning, and I had the need to share my love. I decided to put a little piece of my love in every tree, and the trees loved me back. And I became one with the trees, but my love did not stop, and it grew more. I put a piece of love in every flower, in the grass, in the earth, and they loved me back, and we became one. And my love grew more and more to love every animal in the world. They responded to my love, and they loved me back, and we became one. But my love kept growing and growing. I put a piece of love in every crystal, in every stone in the ground, in the dirt, in the metals, and they loved me back, and I became one with the earth. And then I decided to put my love in the water, in the oceans, in the river, in the rain, in the snow. And they loved me back and we became one. And still my love grew more and more. I decided to give my love to the air, to the wind. I felt a strong communion with the earth, 
with the wind, with the oceans, with the nature, and my love grew and grew. I turned my head to the sky, to the sun, to the stars, and put a piece of love in every star, in the moon and the sun, and they loved me back. And I became one with the moon and the sun and the stars, and, they, and my love kept growing and growing. And I put a piece of love, I put a piece of my love in every human, and I became one with the whole of humanity. Wherever I go, whomever I meet, I see myself in their eyes because I'm a part of everything, because I am love. And then the old man opens his own chest, takes out his heart with that beautiful flame inside, and he puts that flame in your heart. And now that love is growing inside you. Now you are one with the wind, with the water, with the stars, with all the nature, with all the animals, with all the humans. You feel the heat and the light em em emanating from the flame in your heart. Out of your head shines a beautiful light of different colors. You are radiant with the glove of love and peace. Thank you, creator of the universe, for the gift of life you have given me. Thank you for giving me everything that I have ever truly needed. Thank you for the, the opportunity, opportunity to experience this beautiful body and this wonderful mind. Thank you for living inside me with all of your love, with your pure and boundless spirit, with your warm and radiant light. Thank you for using my words, for using my eyes, for using my heart to share your love wherever I go. I love you just the way you are and because I am your creation. I love myself just the way I am. Help me to keep the love and peace in my heart and to make that love a new life that I may live in love for the rest of my life. There it is. I would say all done, but more like just begun. Whew. Well, that was, that was really enjoyable for me. I really enjoyed that. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. That was the end of my paraphrasing of this book. Essentially, we kind of just, I mean, I picked out the best parts and I probably cut it down to maybe one third of the entire book. So what I just read in the last hour was about one third of the book. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think what I get from the book, like I want to go ahead and like really strengthen the four agreements in my mind. Don't make assumptions, don't take things personal, be impeccable with your word, and my favorite, be your best. Um, I really am trying to strengthen that in my mind. Um, but I think, I think the biggest thing I'm taking from this book is how we're all one. And I, I don't know why they, they really push the, that we're all connected through light. And I could see that. I can definitely see that. I mean, if there was... If there was no light at night, like if there was no moonshine, moonshine, if there was no shine from the moon, um, you know, now we live with all this little uh, fake light, and not fake light, but, you know, light bulbs and all that, so there's always a lot of uh, light at night. Um, but if it weren't for the light at night, I mean, you can imagine what it would be like if it was just completely dark outside. I mean, there would just not be much. So I can understand kind of what they mean by um, by everyone's connected through light. It makes a lot of sense. So I don't know. I I'd like to to start transforming my own life. Um, just become better at everything. And uh, you know, I I think what I've been noticing in the last couple days is that. It doesn't matter what you have. Um, it doesn't matter how rich you are, how beautiful you are. Um, you know, I'm really starting to notice that underprivileged people, the handicapped people, that homeless people, that they really radiate a lot of happiness. And that the more the more the privileges that we have, the more privileged people, they seem to be less happy because they are building that mitote that they talk about in here. The mitote is this 
your mind talking from a hundred different directions, never agreeing with itself, it, it never gets anywhere. I don't think that 10 gazillion hours that my mind has wandered and thought of things, did it ever come to a consensus on anything. And I really think that underprivileged, handicapped, homeless people that that there's not much of a mitote in their mind because they're not worrying about stuff. They're not they're not thinking about bills and thinking about their relationships and where where things are going, the future and the past. They're in, they're living in the moment. They're living in the moment. Um, so I, you know, I I feel very privileged. I, you know, I've had a great family, great life great opportunities they're always arising and I think it's it's part of the reason why I just haven't progressed at the rate I wish I would um, I think the mitote in my mind the many the many voices in my head that they're overwhelming and I'm ready to, to transform myself and I think this book is is a good guidance um, I uh, I want to keep finding more books. This is just one of a zillion books. Um, this is a really good one. Definitely a good one for me to start off with and start working with. Um, but I will be getting more books, more books and um, doing like this, deciphering the book, highlighting the book, uh, getting the best parts out of it, and then hopefully doing more streams like this. You know, it feels good to express express it to other people, you know. I definitely enjoy that. Um, so that being said, um, I don't know, just, you know, it's it's a bizarre thing because, like this, this book was saying, we've been domesticated to think a certain way. And so, so when we're, when we're living our life, when we're at work, when we're at home, when we're talking to our friends, we want to gossip. We want to assume things. We want to. We want to take things personal, you know. And it's just, it, we're so used to it. We've been doing it for so long that it's hard to break. You know, this book says you can't do it in one day, and it takes practice. It's a slow process, but it's it's feasible. It's extremely feasible because people do it all the time. And we can rid ourselves from this talk in our head, from these mitote, from this thousands of discussions and bartering in our mind and never coming to any conclusion. And literally, we see things one way in our mind and another part of our mind is looking at the exact opposite way. It's just, it's insane. It's, it's pointless. There's no point in that. Um, I... The, la the yesterday at work, I tried to, I tried to like stop. I, I want to use the word gossip. I, I really try and avoid gossip, but they say good or bad gossip because everyone says gossip and they think it's a bad thing. But good gossip too um, is just e equally as much gossip that we don't need. You don't need to be complimented all the time. We're too busy. You got to be busy, straight headed and going forward. Um, but what I noticed at work was like, I was almost stopping myself from saying many things that I normally would say and it left it left open a door of nothing and I was a little bit more quiet and less social because I was avoiding things that I would normally say so it seemed a little difficult for me at first to to stop doing things that I know would be against the four agreements because it left me with with nothing to fill the fill that space and air um, so that's something I'm working on um, you know, just, I try to avoid, like, talking about what I'm doing or what I did, about how I feel, and just, just living, you know, just going the right path. 